everyone, I'm Adam Harrington. Today I'm hanging out in the woods on this beautiful spring day. And I thought I'd take you along and show you some of the mushrooms that I'm finding. So we're approaching mid-May. As you can tell, a lot of the greenery in the understory has filled in. A lot of the deciduous canopy has filled in, but not all of it. You know, some of our nut-bearing trees are the last trees to put out their leaves, including the walnut trees and the hickory trees. But as far as your elm trees and your ash trees and your sycamore trees and maple trees, they already put out their leaves a couple weeks ago. So they're already shading out a lot of the understory where they can be found. Now another tree that already put out its leaves is the tulip tree, Liriodendron tulipifera, and I'm actually in a grove full of tulip trees. And I found this spot about a year and a half ago while filming a turkey tail video in October, in the autumn months. And I found this spot and I knew that I should come back here in the spring months just because certain morel mushroom species can be found in areas with a lot of tulip trees. So I came here trying to see if I can find some morel mushrooms. If I don't find any, that's okay because there's probably some other mushroom species to be found. So I thought I'd take you along. So if you're interested in seeing what I find, come along with me and we'll see what kind of fungal species we can find in these particular woods. Okay, so I found some mushrooms and it didn't take me too long to find them. But I was looking around these different tulip trees and I found this really neat one because it's semi hollowed out, but it is a living tree. There's an intact canopy at the top of this. Right at the bottom in this hollowed out cavity, you could see some fungi. So which mushrooms are those? Well, these are ink cap mushrooms. They're coprinoid fungi and more specifically, they are mica cap mushrooms and they belong to the Coprinellus micaceous group. This could be Coprinellus micaceus, but some purists will say, unless I use a microscope, you can't tell which species you have. Well, it doesn't really matter when you're out here in the field because these are all edible as long as they're part of the Coprinellus micaceus group. Now, some people might not say they're choice edible mushrooms, but that's okay. It's still an important decomposer of organic debris and it's always fun to find them. They tend to grow all year round, actually. You can even find them in the winter months during mild or warmer spells, but they tend to proliferate throughout the spring months and you usually find them in clusters much bigger than this. So sometimes you'll find clusters of 30, even 40 mushrooms all growing together, all seemingly connected near their base, but they're growing right around each other. There are only about five right here. And I wonder if I come back within a couple days if I'll see more. I only see five right here, but they're beautiful specimens. And these are the perfect stage for harvesting them because they don't show any signs of deliquescence. So what the heck is deliquescence? Well, deliquescence is the process of autodigestion that you see in some coprinoid fungi. That's why they call some of these mushrooms ink cap mushrooms because they tend to liquefy their gills and their caps turn into this black inky goo. Now, not all coprinoid fungi do that, but the ones that do are colloquially referred to as ink cap mushrooms. So this is an ink cap mushroom. If I wait one day, if I wait two days, I might miss the opportunity to harvest these. Now, I think I'll just harvest one so I can show you what it looks like. I'll harvest the biggest one and the biggest one actually pulled up another one so there are two right here and you could tell this is the perfect stage for harvesting because the gills are still white there's no signs of deliquescence whatsoever so I wouldn't be surprised if this started fruiting maybe a day ago if not a day and a half maybe two days ago but the life cycle is so short in Coprinellus micaceus it only lasts a couple of days so you really have to grab it before it starts to deliquesce and these cook really really quickly and so if you put them in a pan, you don't want to cook them for 10, 15 minutes because they'll basically turn into nothing, just a black mess. So three, four, five, six, maybe seven minutes tops. And that's how you want to cook this species. So you can see it has the bell-shaped cap. It has these mica-like granules on it. When you look at the underside, these fertile surfaces, you see gills. These gills are very closely spaced together and they're white. And you also see that it has a white stem. You can see that it's fused at the base. All these signs point towards Coprinellus micacea. So I'm glad that I found these because I always love finding mushrooms in the spring months, especially when you don't think you're going to find too many species. It doesn't grow in association with tulip trees. It grows in association with a wide variety of trees. So Coprinellus micacea, the mica cap. Let's go see what else we can find. So not too far away from that tulip tree, I found a black cherry tree that's clearly dead. It doesn't go up too far, maybe 10, 15 feet, and then it's just knocked off completely. This is a dead black cherry tree and I'm finding mushrooms that are associated with its death. It's helping to return these nutrients back into the soil and to pass it down the ecological line. 
These mushrooms are deer mushrooms, Pluteus cervinus. Now this is edible, but it's not considered choice by anyone that I know, and it's not considered to be a beginner's mushroom either. But I enjoy finding this mushroom early in the year because I haven't seen it for a couple months, but by the time you see it once or twice or three or four times, then you kind of get sick of seeing it during the summer months and the fall months as well. Because by that time, you're looking for your chanterelles and your black trumpets and chicken of the woods and a lot of your bolete mushrooms. But hey, in early May, when there's not much else out there, I mean, this is a very welcoming sight, the deer mushroom. And this is the perfect stage to harvest this mushroom. Because as this mushroom matures, it gets really soggy, it gets really buggy, like most other edible mushrooms that are out there. But this one is the perfect stage right here. It's just opening up right now. So we did get some rains a couple days ago. That's probably when this mica caps opened up. That's when these ones are opening up as well. Now, there are a couple key identifying features to help you positively identify a deer mushroom if you're unfamiliar with it. Now, whenever you look at the cap, the cap of this mushroom is brownish or tannish. It can appear to be wrinkled. It's relatively smooth. You don't see any hairs on it. Now, the key features really are on the underside because when you look at the underside, you see gills that are closely spaced. Now, they're white at first. They're white at first because the spores haven't matured. Once the spores mature, these gills will turn pinkish, pinkish tan, and that's because the spore print produced by the deer mushroom is pinkish tan. So in older specimens, you're going to see that. Now, another key feature of this mushroom is that the gills do not touch the stem. And so these gills are known as non-attached because they don't touch the stem. If you look really closely, you'll see that there's almost like a little racetrack right where the gills meet the stem. That's a key feature. It means these gills are non-attached. So you get the pink spore print, you get the white to pinkish gills, and you have the non-attached gills. That leads me to believe that this is a deer mushroom, and it is a deer mushroom because when you smell it, it should smell radishy, and it kind of imparts a radishy flavor into your meals if you do cook it. Now there is an older specimen right over here, so I'm going to pluck an older specimen. And believe it or not, this is a deer mushroom as well, even though it doesn't really look like it. But if you would let this younger one go for a little bit, it will eventually turn into something that looks rather similar to this more mature deer mushroom. So the more mature one, you can tell that the spores have matured because the gills are pinkish tan. And look how the gills do not touch the stem. It's very, very apparent in this specimen. There's a huge racetrack right where the gills meet the stem. So I would definitely not eat this more mature specimen. It looks way past its prime. But these younger ones all around here that are just opening up, I mean, they look really delicious. They don't taste that great in my opinion, but they are edible. And if you season them properly, maybe if you want to cover up that radish taste or if you want to accent that radish taste, well, it's totally up to you. But remember, this is not a beginner's mushroom. And you want to make sure you compare and contrast this to members of the Entoloma genus. And Entoloma is a genus of pink spored mushrooms that can resemble Pluteus mushrooms. But with Entoloma mushrooms, the gills touch the stem. So they fully touch the stem. Whereas with the Pluteus mushrooms, with the deer mushroom, you see that the gills do not touch the stem. So deer mushroom Pluteus cervinus, again, this is probably part of a larger group. Some purists might say, you can't tell me that this is Pluteus cervinus without using a microscope, but that's okay. In the field, we can call it Pluteus cervinus. If you feel like bringing it home and cooking it up, then be my guest, but make sure you're absolutely positive of its identification before you do something like that. Okay, so by now you're probably wondering, when is he going to show us some morel mushrooms? Well. I haven't showed you any yet because I haven't found any morel mushrooms so far. And that's okay because that's how mushroom hunting goes. You know, you go out for one thing and then you tend to find a lot of other things as well. And that's perfectly fine because what fun would a mushroom hunt be? You found everything that you're looking for every single time you went out into the woods. You know, it's like a treasure hunt when you're foraging for mushrooms, especially morel mushrooms. So I'm in the right habitat, as I mentioned. I mean, these are all Liriodendron tulipifera tulip trees. Some people also call them tulip poplar trees, some people call them yellow poplar trees, but they're not a true poplar species. You know, poplar species typically refer to members in the populist genus, which is part of the willow family or the Saliaceae family. But this tree, the tulip tree, is part of the magnolia family. You can tell there's some resemblance with the flowers because these flowers are very large and beautiful. They almost look like tulip flowers, but unfortunately, because these trees are so tall, it's hard to see the flowers in the spring months. But every now and then you get lucky and you see a, a lower tree closer to the ground, and you can observe those flowers. Now another thing that I'm looking for to find tulip trees, you're looking at the forest floor or the woodsy floor, and you often find these very long and narrow fruit remnants. So 
these trees put up fruits known as samaras. These are winged fruits, and you'll see the remnants all year long. So these aren't these year's remnants. This is from last year or even a previous year. They just haven't decomposed yet. But if you're seeing a lot of these little long, narrow fruit remnants, that means that there are tulip trees nearby. So I'm in the right habitat. I just gotta slow down my search, but hopefully we can find some morel mushrooms, at least one, because I really wanna show you one morel mushroom in this video and not get skunked in this particular habitat. So let's go see if we can find at least one morel mushroom. Okay, so I've been looking around for maybe 20 or 30 minutes, and there's one more thing I wanna show you about tulip trees. That's from where those fruit remnants come from. You'll typically see these conical-like structures at the top of tulip trees all winter long. This is produced after the tree fruits. So you're going to see these, and they'll eventually fall to the ground. So if you see these, that's from where those fruit remnants come from. So you can see these long, narrow strips right here. But they're in a cluster right here, so you're typically gonna see them wherever you find tulip trees. So look for these, then look around and look up, and there are tulip trees in the area. So I'm in the right habitat. Did I find any morel mushrooms? Yes, right here. There's a morel mushroom right here. Can you see it all the way down here? And that's why morel mushrooms are elusive, because they blend in so easily with the surrounding habitat. So it did take me a long time to find these, and that's because you know I was doing some other things as well, looking for some other mushrooms. But if you're persistent, and if you're dedicated, you will eventually find morel mushrooms. But you just gotta keep checking and checking and checking. But even if you're in the right area at the right time, it's no guarantee that you will find them. But if you keep checking, if you extend your search, and especially if you find one, keep looking around because you'll probably find more. So this one is Morcella diminutiva. Maybe you've heard of Morcella diminutiva, maybe you haven't. This is part of the esculenta clade, or the blonde morel clade, or the yellow morel clade. And this one actually shares some morphological features with black morels. Now it doesn't turn blackish like you would find in a black morel, but these caps are typically more conical or subconical in shape compared to some of the other yellow morel mushrooms. And also the pits and ridges are typically more vertically oriented in Morcella diminutiva compared to some of the other yellow morel mushrooms. This one I typically find later in the season, so late April through May, at least here in western Pennsylvania, and that's typically when our morel season is winding down. But you can find it during the whole yellow morel season, but these are typically the last ones to hang on, at least in the habitats that I tend to explore. So they call it Morcella diminutiva. Why? Why do you think they call it Morcella diminutiva? Because it's typically smaller than some other morel mushroom species, but some of these can grow up to six inches or taller but it typically doesn't get as tall as some of the other yellow morel mushrooms like Morcella americana, which can grow up to 10 inches tall or even greater than that. So there's one right here. I'm just going to cut this one off so you can see what it looks like. And this one is rather small, but you can see that the cap is completely attached to the stalk. It's very characteristic for morels, very characteristic especially for yellow morels. Now half free morels will have caps that are halfway attached to the stalk. Black morels will typically have a little sinus or groove right where the cap meets the stalk but members of the esculenta clade typically have caps that are fully attached, and I can see it's completely hollow inside. So, are there any more morels around here? What do you think? you think there are any more morels around here? Well, let me pull up the camera, and let me show you what else I think I have found. So this is the general area, lots of tulip trees, but there are some other trees as well. There's some witch hazel, and then we got some of the shrubs, like Japanese barberry. There's a lot of that in these woods. The herbaceous layer contains some garlic mustard, some white snake root. This is white snake root, a toxic plant. So right over there where the leaf litter's kind of kicked up, that's where we found the original morel mushroom. So let's look around because if there's one, there's probably more. And sure enough, there's one right there. So this is Morcella diminutiva, the same species. I'm not too surprised. That's probably all we'll find today because this is an area heavy with tulip trees. And this one grows in association with tulip trees. Now, just doesn't grow with tulip trees. You also find Morcella diminutiva growing in association with white ash trees and hickory trees east of the Rocky Mountains. And what's interesting is that the exact role and association with these trees is unknown. Some people report saprophytic roles. Some people report mycorrhizal roles or both roles during the life cycle of the morel mushroom.
but this is a rather cryptic mushroom right here as far as the roll is concerned. This is the perfect stage to harvest it. I mean, it's kind of small, but this is the average size specimen of Morcella diminutiva. But because it's getting some sunlight, because rain isn't really in the forecast the next few days, today would be a good day to harvest that one. Now right underneath it, right here is another burrow mushroom. It kind of looks like something stepped on it. Maybe that something was me. This one looks a little beat up, so I would leave this one behind. But that's good news right there. If we find two right here and one over there, there might be some more. So let's look a little more closely. And wow, right in the sunlight, right there. Making some vitamin D2, apparently. So that's Morcella diminutiva again. You can see the long, slender stalk, much longer in proportion compared to the cap. You can see how the cap has these vertically oriented pits and ridges, and they're rather wide as well. And within these pits, that's where the ASCI are, A-S-C-I, that's from where the spores are dispersed. And this is a sterile stock right here, so no spores are dispersed out of here. It's all within these pits on the head of the morel mushroom. So we've got one right here, we've got two back there, but that one I probably wouldn't harvest. Are there any more around here? I wouldn't be surprised. But I don't know if it's going to take me a long time. I don't want to waste your time as I look for morel mushrooms. So now we're about 10 feet away from the original spot. But we could probably still find some more, including this one right here. So how about that one right there? This one almost looks like a half-free morel. If you're familiar with Morcella punctipes, the half free morel in eastern North America has a long slender stalk like this which is studded with these little dots kind of like you see right here but the half free morel's cap is only attached halfway. But this is Morcella diminutiva even with the long slender stalk the cap is fully attached to the stalk right here. So this one's a little dried out right here that's why I think today would be a good day to harvest most of these just because the sun is beating down on all of them and we don't have much rain in the forecast. So this one is still good for harvesting, even though it's kind of dried out right there. Are there any more around here? So that's pretty good. We found a couple so far. I'm excited. Lots of Japanese barberry right here. Wait, I think I see another one. How about that one? Wow, that one's very difficult to see. This one's kind of dried out near the top. And you can see that there aren't many pits and ridges on this one. That one's really interesting. But this is another Morcella diminutiva. But it kind of looks like the half free morel just because of its long slender stalks. We found a lot actually so far. And I'm actually really excited. I don't know if I'll find much more. But I will continue to look. But you just take a look around. I'm not too surprised because we've got tulip trees. Liriodendron tulipifera. And we're looking in May in western Pennsylvania. This is the time to get out and look for Morcella diminutiva or other morel mushrooms that grow in association with tulip trees. Okay, so I would call that a successful day mushroom hunting because we found three different species in a short amount of time. I'm sure if we kept looking, we would find more. Now, out of all the morel mushrooms, we found six total. I only harvested four of them. One, two, three, four. Really grateful for these. I don't mind leaving some behind because I know that other foragers would appreciate it. Other animals, insects, and the land would probably appreciate it too because I don't think it just puts things out here for human beings, especially morel mushrooms. I'm sure it's happy that we forage morel mushrooms, but leaving some behind, I think that's a good token of gratitude. To leave some behind no matter what you find. And so we got morel mushrooms, mica caps, deer mushrooms. I'm going to cook these up and enjoy them for a nice spring meal. I did find some morel mushrooms last week, the week before that. Found quite a few actually. And it's been a really good year, 2019, here in eastern North America. So if your season is in full swing, keep looking. You'll probably find some more. If your season hasn't started yet, we'll get ready because it should be pretty good. If your season has passed its prime, we'll get ready for the mid to late spring fungi because there's a lot of them out there. So get out and see what you can find. I'm wishing you the best of luck for a successful spring mushroom hunting season.